you know I've been coming here off and on ever since I was Assistant Secretary of the Navy beginning in 1913 and that's over 30 years ago. It's uh, nearly about four weeks ago since I left Washington. But of course, at, at all times, I have been in close touch with the work there and also in daily communication with our forces in the European and Far Eastern theaters of war. Since my visit here at Bremerton, two, nearly two years ago, I have been happy at all times to know of the splendid progress that is being maintained, kept up, both here and at many other places on the coast. Progress in turning out ships and planes and munitions of almost every other kind. And in the training of men and women for all of the armed services. So I have thought that you would be interested in a, an informal summary of the trip I have just taken to Hawaii and from there to the Aleutian Islands and Alaska, from which, when I get across the sound, I am about to step foot on the shore of the continental United States again. When I got the actual operation of the future landing, the cruiser, which is on our way to another place, the cruiser on which I went from San Diego to Honolulu is one of a number of what we call post-treaty cruisers, much larger and more powerful and faster than the pre-war cruisers, which were limited by the old treaties to 10,000 tons. This particular ship on which I voyaged joined the Pacific Fleet less than a year ago in the western and southwestern Pacific. Hers is a magnificent record. Her skip arrived at Pearl Harbor on July 26. And at this moment, may I just add a word of appreciation to the press and the radio of our country. You know we have a voluntary censorship, purely voluntary. I want to thank them for the protection and the security which they gave to me and to my party at a time on this trip when nearly all the time I was within easy reach of enemy action the press associations, and some of the newspapers actually refused to publish the fact which they got from local friends who had heard of my arrival and my trip around the Hawaiian Islands, uh, from local friends who, whose sons out there had written home about it. And the newspapers didn't print it. That is a modern a marvel. Well, I got there on the 26th of July, and what an amazing change since my visit there 10 years ago. As big and bigger a change than a comparison between the Puget Sound Navy Yard of today with what it was 10 years ago. But out there, the chain, the, at that time, Pearl Harbor had maintained a steady growth, as this yard had. But today, it is capable of making repairs to the heaviest ships 
and employs a force nearly ten times as brief as it did then. And incidentally, very many of that force came straight there uh, during the past two years and a half from the West Coast. All of the battleships and smaller craft that were sunk or damaged in the attack at Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 41, have been raised with the exception of the Arizona. In her case, because of the explosion in her forward magazine, salvage was impossible. But, again in her case, the main battery of heavy guns was removed and remounted, and now forms a part of the coastal defenses of the island of Oahu. Three days on the island of Oahu, and everywhere, as at the Navy Yard, the war activities have multiplied almost beyond belief. On the afternoon of my arrival, my old friend, General Douglas MacArthur, arrived by air from New Guinea. And we began a series of extremely interesting and useful conferences, accompanied by Admiral Nimitz and by my own Chief of Staff, Admiral Leahy, who stands beside me now, and General Richardson, the commanding general of the Army Forces in the Hawaiian area, and Admiral Halsey, commander of the Third Fleet. In these three days we were there, we talked about Pacific problems and the best methods of conducting the Pacific campaign in the days to come. These discussions developed a complete accord, both in the understanding of the problem that confronts us and in the opinion as to the best methods for its solution. All of us must bear in mind the enormous size of the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific area, keeping a mental map of the world constantly in mind. The distances are greater there than anywhere else on Earth. In the old days, the Hawaiian Islands used to be considered an outpost. We were not allowed to fortify Guam, nor did we fortify Wake, or Midway, or Samoa. Today, the Hawaiian Islands are no longer a mere outpost. They constitute a major base from which, and from the Pacific coast, frontline operations are being conducted twice as far away as the distance between the coast and Hawaii itself. The Hawaiian Islands have helped to make possible the victories at Guadalcanal and New Guinea and the Marshalls and the Marianas. The islands will make possible future operations in China. Will make possible the recapture and independence of the Philippines and make possible the carrying of war into the home islands of Japan itself and their capital city of Tokyo. It is from there that a great part of the expedition for the recapture of Atu and Kiska started. Adak two, two years ago was a bleak and practically uninhabited spot, which with the other Aleutian Islands seemed relatively unimportant in the plans for the security of our own continent. You here can well realize the commotion 
that followed the Japanese occupation of Atu and Kiska. You dreamt of Japanese marching up the street of Bremen, of Seattle, tomorrow morning. You may have so they abandoned the illusion. The climate of ADAC is not the most inviting in the world, but I want to say a word of appreciation to the thousands of officers and men of all the services who have built up this base and other bases, many other bases, in the extreme northwest of the American continent. Built them up in such a short time to a point where the people on our Pacific coast, the people of British Columbia and of Alaska, can feel certain that we are safe against Japanese invasion on any large scale. Other posts are considering settling in Alaska after the war's over. And to help, help to build up all kinds of new things in new lands. So this trip has given me a chance talk over the social and economic feature, future of the Hawaiian group with Governor Steinbeck and the future of the people of Alaska with Governor Grooming. By the way, he asked me to assure you that the TAM, which I've acquired in the last uh, week, has come from the bright sunlight of Alaska. Near Juneau, one afternoon, when we were nearly park bound, I played hooky for three hours. I went fishing, and I caught one halibut and one flounder. Speaking again of the future, of the future of the defense of the Pacific, the use of its strong points in order to prevent attacks against us. You who live in the Pacific Northwest have realized that a line for sea and air navigation following the Great Circle course from Puget Sound to Siberia and China passes very close to the Alaskan coast and thence westward along the line of the Aleutian Islands. From the point of view of national defense, therefore, it is essential that our control of this route shall be undisputed. Everybody in Siberia and China knows that we have no ambition to acquire land on the Asiatic continent. We as a people are utterly opposed to aggression and sneak attacks. But we as a people are insistent that other nations must not under any circumstances through the foreseeable future commit such attacks against the United States. Therefore, it is essential that we be fully prepared to prevent them for all time to come. The word and the honor of Japan cannot be trusted. That is a simple statement from the military, naval, air point of view. But with the end of a Japanese threat, soon we hope, there is an excellent outlook for a permanent peace in the whole of the Pacific area. It is therefore natural and proper for us to think of the economic and the commercial future. It is logical that we should foresee a great interchange of commerce between our shores and those of Siberia and China. And in this commercial development, Alaska and the Aleutian Islands become automatic stepping stones for trade, both by water and by cargo planes. And this means the automatic development of transportation on the way there, including 
the Puget Sound area. It is as long as 10 years, I think, in getting to and from the Asiatic and the American continent. We understand at last the importance of the Hawaiian Islands. It is important that we have other bases, forward bases, nearer to Japan than Hawaii lies. The same thing we have to remember holds true in regard to the defense of all the other American republics, 20 others, from Mexico down past the Panama Canal and all the way down to Chile. There are hundreds of islands in the South Pacific that bear the same relation to South America and Central America and the Panama Canal as Hawaii bears to North America. These islands are mostly in the possession of the British Empire and the French. They are important commercially, just as they are from the defense point of view, because they lead to New Zealand and Australia, and the Dutch Islands and the Southern Philippines. With all these places, we undoubtedly are going to have a growing trade. We have no desire to ask for any possessions of the United Nations, but the United Nations, who are working so well with us in the winning of the war, will, I am confident, be glad to join us in protection against aggression and in machinery to prevent aggression. With them and with their help, I am sure that we can agree completely so that Central and South America will be a safe against attack, attack from the South Pacific, as North America is going to be very soon, from the North Pacific as well. The South, among hundreds of millions of them, a desire for the right to work out their own destiny. And they show no evidence in this Pacific area to overrun the Earth, with one exception. That exception is, and has been for many, many years, that of Japan and the Japanese people. Because whether or not the people of Japan itself know and approve of what their warlords and the home lords have done for nearly a century. The fact remains that they seem to be giving party approval to the Japanese policy of acquisition of their neighbors and their neighbors' land, and a military and economic control of as many other nations as they can lay their hands on. It's an unfortunate fact that other nations cannot trust Japan. It's an unfortunate fact that for years, that, that years of proof must pass by before we can trust Japan. And before we can classify Japan as a member of the Society of Nations which seek permanent peace and whose word we can take. I didn't have the opportunity of taking this short trip, first for the conferences with General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, and secondly, for the first-hand view of certain bases that are of vital importance to the ending of the war and to the prevention in the future of any similar attack. More than a million of our troops are today overseas in the Pacific. The war is well in hand in the vast area, but I cannot tell you if I knew when the war will be over, either in Europe or in the Far East, or the war against Japan itself. It will be over sooner. 
if the people of this country will maintain the making of the necessary supplies of ships and planes of all the things that go with them. By so doing, we shall hasten the day of the peace. By so doing, we will save our own pocketbooks and those of our children. And by so doing, we will stand a better chance of substantial unity, not only at home, but among the United Nations, in laying so securely what we all want, the fun of a lasting peace.